whether I'm here to be the warning old curmudgeon about uh, the problems or the cheerleader for how fantastic it is that the whole food issue has almost completely swallowed the sustainability issue. <laughs> Uh, and I suppose I'm going to give some of the underpinning reasons why that should be the case. Uh, from the big systems point of view, uh, even though many of us can see that we uh, appreciate food more than we probably appreciate energy efficiency or renewable technology for sort of fairly obvious reasons. I want to start with uh, the really big picture view, looking at this slide that I've used uh, since my book Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability came out in 2002 to map the large change from more or less pre-industrial sustainable cultures uh, up through the great energy mountain to the point we arrived at at the moment, where energy and resource use, food production, population and pollution have all basically tracked in sync over a period of 10,000 years, but accelerated enormously in the last 250. So we're now at a climax, a sort of a postmodern cultural uncertainty about the future. And humanity's future over the next 250 years or so could be described by four possible futures that have to reflect ecological and energetic realities. Uh, the first I call techno-explosion. Uh, I suppose this continues the patterns of the last 250 years and has our descendants having holidays, uh, if not living on Mars and um, eating uh, genetically engineered microbes. Now, I was actually promised that future when I was an adult, but it's been a bit slow uh, coming about. Uh, the second uh, view of the future um, is really one that uh, I call techno-stability. And this really came out of the Limits to Growth uh, work in 1972, and it's really the underpinning framework for mainstream sustainability. And it says that we're going to maintain most of the benefits of civilization, but somehow stabilise um, a use of resources, uh, etc. Uh, and maybe we're all going to be driving electric cars and eating uh, very nice uh, organic food. Um, there's the next scenario, which is one I call energy descent. And this really involves a continuous reduction in the energy and resource available to support uh, each succeeding generation. Uh, so it's really governed by very different patterns. Um, maybe we can imagine descendants mostly staying at home and eating what grows in the village. Um, there's, of course, uh, a fourth scenario, uh, which I call collapse, which is a little bit difficult to see. Um, and I suppose people often jump to the conclusion that that's where we're headed if uh, number one or number two uh, aren't working, and completely jump over this uh, energy descent possibility. So collapse is the end of civilization, if not most of life, and I suppose we can imagine our descendants dying out after eating each other. So um, permaculture is really uh, the creative designed response to the energy descent future. And the important thing about that is that it's a culture of continuous change, and that's exactly what we've come from. It's just that it's in uh, a radically uh, different direction. So this energy descent is the decline in net energy available to support humanity. So that net energy is the energy profit after all the direct and indirect costs of production are subtracted. Now I'm not talking about what Lo Yang produces just. I'm talking about the whole underpinning of human existence, the same way that every ecosystem is dependent on energy and that energy shapes every uh, system. We like to think of that as a gentle decline, like a balloon coming back to Earth as the most hopeful future. But energy descent is likely to mirror energy ascent very fast over several decades and then more slowly over several centuries. 
The sting in the tail is really that the rate of change appears much greater because of this radical change in direction. Effectively, continuous economic contraction. Um, and there are some severe problems uh, with that. But we see a lot of opportunities in energy descent, which is of course permaculture focuses on uh, the positives, what are the opportunities to do something. The higher prices for energy, and therefore food, I think people understand that very strong linkage between energy cost and food cost now in an industrialised food system, will allow low input and organic farming to compete in, against intensive land uses. Uh, whereas they've had to exist in the sheltered workshop of uh, boutique uh, marketing uh, up till now. It'll increase incentives uh, for local, including urban agriculture. It'll increase incentives for home-based uh, garden agriculture, so working within the household economy uh, rather than the monetary economy. And it'll stimulate the growth of food co-ops, community gardens, city farms, farmers markets and CSAs. Uh, because, of course, the emotional enthusiasm that exists amongst a minority for these things won't actually grow and be sustained unless those reflect underlying economic and ultimately ecological and energetic realities. So the reduced mobility of people and goods, which comes from this just inevitably, changes things also. It kickstarts the household and local economies, this process we call relocalisation. Because the household economy and the community economies are actually much more efficient at doing many functions in society and used to do in almost every society the majority of the economic functions. We're not in the monetary economy at all. So this relocalisation is not just how we get um, local monetary transactions to replace uh, ones which are uh, currently dominated by corporations in a globalised world. A lot of it actually restarts from the bottom up. And we see this in a lot of systems, that rather than systems adjusting back uh, to changes in energy, you actually get a regrowth from the bottom. So this makes local products more competitive than imported ones, stimulates self-reliance, repair, retrofitting and recycling, increases community interaction and exchange. Not all, that'll be, all that will be positive, but at least people will be talking to their neighbours, may, maybe just because they can't get away from them. <laughs> so this relocalisation will shift power and value to respect for older people with self-reliant skills, especially uh, ability to grow more food than you eat, um, and respect for people who can work physically, which would be a huge turnaround in our uh, culture. Uh, and the demand for permaculture as life skills, uh, education, transition strategies, and design principles for system redesign, whether that's called permaculture or not. Uh, it will all be the same systemic principles. But in putting that positive view, I've also uh, done a lot of work, I suppose, on looking over the horizon of the ways in which this energy descent future could um, play out, not so much over that 250 year time horizon, but over the next uh, one to four decades. And I see in that energy descent future, two primary drivers, one being climate change and the uncertainties around that from relatively benign to uh, very destructive, uncertainty there, and uncertainty on the other axis in whether oil production post peak will be a relatively gentle decline as it looks like so far, or whether it will be more precipitous. That creates four different possible combinations which I believe are fundamental drivers, uh, whereas the economic processes are symptomatic of those, as are the geopolitical and the psychosocial. So there's four scenarios come out of that, green tech, brown tech, earth steward, and lifeboat. I don't see any of these as the end of civilization, but they certainly change the way we live 
very radically and for a lot of people would experience them as very much for the worst. My most recent work is I've gone beyond waiting that 10 years and say, well, it looks like we're heading into the brown tech world, which is structurally rapid climate change and relatively slow, uh, slow decline in oil. Whatever the future holds, it's very difficult to get past uh, the consensus view that we are either in a techno-stability world or in some version of the continuing techno-explosion world and that all public discourse must happen at that level. For the last 10 years, I've been um, going through the discipline of uh, ignoring those which I've personally ignored for all of my adult life. We've always expected after the evidence of the Club of Rome Limits to Growth Report of 1972 that those limits created inevitably some sort of energy descent, if not collapse. So the vulnerabilities of the current um, food production system are around things like how much energy and water does our current system uh, use and how does that compare to housing and personal transport where we've had a bit of a longer lineage of maybe thinking about those things. And how large is an improvement could we get by redesigning the food system uh, compared with redesigning our housing and transport? So to look at that uh, vulnerability, the dependence on, uh, on artificial nutrients uh, in existing agriculture system is probably the most pivotal, uh, especially the massive increase in nitrogen inputs into Australian agriculture, which you can see there, starting to more reflect the way uh, uh, industrial agriculture is in the rest of the, the world, and that continuing rise in phosphorus and uh, potassium inputs. Uh, those uh, vulnerabilities around that uh, are the most important and that the only significant substitute for that is human waste and wastes from where people live, which is the most fundamental reason why food in the long term must be produced where people live. So if we look at uh, water, um, fit more than 50% actually when we include the, the um, food in restaurants and in home gardens of the, our water use is actually in our food system. It's not in our houses or in our industry. And in terms of embodied water, these are huge figures that are involved, uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, over a thousand litres per dollar of value for dairy products. Our two goat dairy at Meliodora, as far as I can tell, um, uses about two litres per dollar of value. You can see uh, we're not quite that dramatically um, uh, more efficient uh, than commercial agriculture in vegetables and fruit, but still more efficient. So growing food at home and on a small scale in urban areas using stormwater is actually the the strategy for dealing with uh, water crisis, especially when we're talking about perishable food uh, that the, uses the most uh, water. This work from uh, Falk Gunther shows the potential savings in the food system by making some of these basic shifts compared with the efficiencies that we could get by redesigning our houses and um, uh, changing over uh, um, motor cars. So the redesign strategies for su food security in the future are really the relocalisation of food production and what I call the ruralisation of settlements. So that's basically bringing those functions, what we think of as rural functions, back into uh, settlement areas. So the food and the animals come back into our urban areas. There's also big implications for dietary change, that shift back to seasonal local food, less processed and in total less animal protein. 
because of the enormous embodied energy and resources and water that are used to provide uh, most of that food. Organic production methods, including the full recycling to land of all wastes, including human waste, is absolutely fundamental to a future sustainable food system. The polyculture, the integration of crops, livestock and structures, and increase in household size for economies of scale and efficiency of resource use. This is the one that a lot of people really miss, that, but a lot of people who run a household understand how it's a lot easier to grow food and cook food and prepare food for a larger number of people than it is for a smaller number. Okay, um, this presentation will be uh, available in a a different, um, as a PDF form, but I want to uh, skip over some of these issues of how much space, because there is actually plenty of space uh, in our urban areas. Even if we wanted to produce probably all the food for Melbourne, it would be a very, very different society, but we, we could do it. Also, uh, really um, don't want to concentrate on the, the techniques that are needed because I think a lot of people are at least familiar with those. I want to jump to the issue of food distribution strategies and the cost of centralised market systems and how local surpluses can be distributed. And again, this work by Falk Gunther showing the central market system uh, and the price for providing the food uh, for people in Sweden compared with a, a CSA system. And what you see is the cost is basically about half, but a far bigger share goes to the farmer as a salary. That red band is the farmer's salary. You can see the central market system. There's this huge economic overstructure that we can just collapse uh, back. I did use that word collapse, didn't I? Um, it might happen by itself, but of course it's only if we've got the models working there that can um, uh, replace that. You can also see that the producer's costs in a small scale organic uh, system are in the current economy actually greater than the conventional uh, system. But the total benefit to society is actually much greater. So to relocalise food distribution, of course, farmers markets help identify local sources for consumers, um, distribute seasonal surplus uh, for home processing and preserving, and also encourage gardeners to become new producers. This is one of the most critical ways in which we get uh, the next generation of farmers. It's actually people who start off producing food at a household scale and get good at it. With community supported agriculture and box schemes, for the consumers it's food security, seasonal food culture and the capacity to influence the production system. For producers it's the capital base and the market security. But what it does is that it stimulates polyculture. It actually drives the production system towards providing a greater variety of things, which is very, very technically challenging for farmers to do and it uh, helps stabilise the production peaks and troughs. And it develops potentially a seasonal labour pool and understanding consumers. One of the experiences is that people who've had a go at growing their own food are actually the best customers for these sort of systems because they have a little bit of experience at what's involved and are not so much spoilt brats when it comes to food choices. Another aspect is restaurants and street stalls that provide set menus to reduce waste. The biggest part of the food waste in the uh, restaurant system is this constant on-call a la carte stuff. Now, this is what we uh, provide and there's, that's how we reduce waste. It's really, really obvious. Uh, and local and regional currencies that uh, encourage um, uh, local consumption. So I just want to uh, finish 
with reminding us that no matter how much we organise, the living soil is the water and carbon bank for future food security. And if we don't get that right, um, all the other things really don't work. And this is not a self-evident, easy, uh, down pat thing. Um, it's something we've got to constantly work on, and especially in Australia with our ancient worn out soils. And that other thing that the next generation of farmers with the skills to feed themselves, their kin and community for future uh, food security is really our task. Because as Sharon Astike said in her book, A Nation of Farmers, America needs 50 million new farmers in the next few decades. Uh, now by farmers, she means uh, garden agriculturalists as well as uh, commercial people. How is that going to be achieved? We have no precedent for that process, but we're on the road to starting it. Thanks. Thank